Good morning. Uh, it's my great honor this morning to introduce Dr. Michelle Manji, who sits uh, at the leading edge of neuroscience and neuro-oncology. Uh, Dr. Manji earned her MD and PhD from Stanford. Um, during her graduate training, she published seminal work describing the effect of inflammation and of radiation on hippocampal neurogenesis. And 20 years on, this work has been translated into changes to standard clinical care, including the use of hippocampal avoidance, uh, and memantine uh, to decrease the cognitive effects after whole brain radiation. After medical school, she traveled to uh, MGH in Brigham to complete her residency in neurology and then returned to Stanford for a fellowship in pediatric neuro-oncology. Subsequently, she was invited to join the faculty at Stanford uh, and currently is professor of neurology and is a Howard Hughes investigator and has her own laboratory. Dr. Manji is celebrated for her seminal work on the effect of neuronal activity in the generation of glial precursors and oligodendrocytes, uh, as well as adaptive myelination. And she has fundamentally changed our understanding of glial tumors by demonstrating uh, the formation of synapses between neurons and uh, glioma cells, which uh, are active and actually which are required or, uh, or promote uh, the propagation and growth of gliomas. She's been recognized with uh, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, as well as a MacArthur Fellowship, uh, the Richard Lounsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences, and she's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Manji, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and so wonderful to join you. All right, can you see my slides? Great, um, so, so wonderful to join you um, uh, here from, from Palo Alto. These are my disclosures. Broadly speaking, my laboratory seeks to understand the molecular language that cells use as they you know, work together to build and um, in an ongoing way, remodel the brain. And I wanna tell you one story today in two parts about the way in which neurons interact with the glial cells that form the myelin sheath and how we're increasingly understanding that this is an activity, um, a, activity regulated and adaptive process that tunes neural circuit function uh, relevant to a range of neurological uh, uh, neurological functions. And then how these really powerful interactions between neurons and oligodendroglial cells are hijacked in the context of glial malignancies. But I'd like to start every talk with a broad consideration of neural development. And, and I find the best way to do that is to show you pictures of my children. So <laughs> this is my daughter, Sophie, um, when she was an infant. And, you know, we recognize that there was just so much neurodevelopment that human infants need to undergo every single day in the first year of life that we needed to give her a way to, uh, you know, kind of keep track of her neurodevelopmental to-dos. So uh, we made her this checklist to just make sure she kept on top of all of her, her daily um, uh, neurodevelopmental needs. And it really is just astounding when you consider that human infants make something on the order of 500 billion new synapses every single day in the first year of life, 14,000 new hippocampal neurons, 127 million new cerebellar granule neurons on average um, in, every day in the first year of life. But as impressive as all of that is, perhaps the, the largest task that humans have in the postnatal period is to myelinate our central nervous system. We are a semi-altricial species, you know, unlike horses or zebras, we don't just jump up and uh, start walking, start after, walking birth. after birth, but rather there is, um, you know, quite a, uh, quite a long yeah. period of development required, um, you know, for a, for a full motor and sensory function. And we can understand that in the context of, of um, and I'm wondering if something on the technical end, there's quite an echo. I wonder if you guys could maybe address that. Thank you. Um, we are we are born with essentially no myelin. Um, there is a myelination begins just before birth, um, around the center of the brain, around the central sulcus, and then progresses towards the poles of the brain in a massive wave of, of developmental myelination that happens over the first one to two years of life. But myelination um, is really a very protracted developmental process spanning about thirty years of human neurodevelopment. So, you know, there are you know, many, many years throughout childhood, um, teenage years, and young adulthood that myelin continues uh, to develop. And as, as protracted as this is, there's there are clear patterns that emerge. This um, developmental myelination follows 
really clear topographical and chronological pattern. So there are discrete waves of myelination in parts at certain parts of the nervous system at certain ages. And this, this progression kind of follows the basic pattern that more um, kind of fundamental basic circuitry, such as that that underlies uh, motor and sensory function, myelinates prior to circuits involved in more complex neurological function, like higher cognitive function. So just as an example, there's a discrete wave of myelination in the brainstem um, in mid-childhood, peaking in incidents, or peaking in, in um, uh, myelination around ages six to eight. Um, and then there's a discrete wave of myelination in the neocortex and intercortical association fibers in adolescence and young adulthood. Um, and, you know, these correlate with um, advancements in, in development, the, the brainstem myelination wave, um, you know, kind of coincides with uh, the time in which kids attain, you know, more advanced motor milestones, like being able to skip with alternating feet, uh, being able to ride a bicycle without training wheels. And, and the neocortical myelination, particularly in the frontal cortex, correlates with a time at which, uh, you know, better impulse control decisions are, are made. And so this process of myelination, the process by which um, oligodendrocytes are formed by um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells to ensheath the axonal membrane that decreases the transverse capacitance um, and increases the speed of neural impulse conduction down the axon. This doesn't end at the end of development around age 30, but actually continues throughout the lifespan. And this has been um, you know, a, a continual accumulation of oligodendrocytes, a continual addition of new myelin, particularly in the neocortex and its projections. Um, this has been observed by uh, two photon microscopy and rodents. It's also been appreciated for a number of years in the human neocortex from postmortem samples, as I'm showing you here. And this is important to understand, not only because it's really, I think, very fundamentally interesting, but also because the pattern of gliomogenesis in childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood fits pretty well with that uh, spatiotemporal pattern of developmental myelination, such that at a time when there is a discrete wave of developmental myelination in the ventral pons, this is when one of the worst um, human malignancies, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, tends to occur. And similarly, at a time when there is uh, neocortical and, and intercortical association fiber myelination um, in the cerebral hemispheres, this is when hemispheric high-grade gliomas in, tend to occur um, in the adolescent and young adult period. And, and these observations are concordant with findings from my laboratory and from many others that these tumors we've traditionally thought of as quote unquote astrocytomas, in fact, arise from precursor cells in the oligodendric glial lineage, either bona fide oligodendrocyte precursors or OPCs, or just earlier precursors committed to go down this oligodendric glial differentiation path. And it certainly fits with the um, single cell um, transcriptomic profiles of um, uh, cells within a range of different uh, glial malignancies that point to a prominent and really important, often cancer stem cell population uh, that very closely resembles OPCs. And so we may glean really important lessons about gliomogenesis by better understanding what regulates this process of gliogenesis. And that begs a very basic question. What does regulate the proliferation and functional differentiation of these oligodendric glial lineage precursor cells? Well, one idea that's been in the literature for some time, first introduced in the 1990s by Ben Barris, and then supported by some really beautiful in vitro and correlational work by Doug Fields and others, is the idea that neurons themselves may regulate the extent to which their axons are myelinated in an activity and experience dependent manner. When I, when I entered this field, oh gosh, now about a dozen years ago, this was a really controversial idea because they're also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination. We know that if we put an oligodendrocyte in a Petri dish with any appropriately sized fiber, even inner nanofibers or um, uh, formal and fixed axons, they will myelinate anything of appropriate diameter. Um, and so they're clearly activity independent modes of myelination, but the question was in some regions of the nervous system at some ages, in some circuits on some axons, you know, is there activity regulated um, oligodendrogenesis and de novo myelination or myelin remodeling? Could myelin be plastic and adaptable and might that matter for neurological function? 
And so I'd like to spend the first part of this talk focused on this idea of myelin plasticity, of activity and experience regulated um, uh, myelination or, or uh, fine tuning of myelination in a way that changes the speed of impulse conduction in a circuit and tune circuit dynamics and function. And to introduce you to some of the people who have led this work in my lab, this is Erin Gibson. She was my, my very first postdoctoral fellow. Erin um, is just absolutely brilliant. She started this work in the lab. She's now running her own uh, laboratory in the Department of Psychiatry here at Stanford. If there's anyone in the audience looking for a postdoctoral mentor, Erin is just absolutely fantastic. Similarly brilliant is um, Anna Geardy. She was a postdoc with me and I was fortunate enough to keep in my lab as a, as a senior staff scientist. Um, Juliet Knowles is a pediatric pediatrologist who um, uh, has also gone on to start her own independent laboratory at Stanford. And Belle Nielsen is um, uh, currently finishing up her postdoc and will be on the market this, this year. And I'm just going to say to the technical folks, there's that echo again. So I don't know if someone needs to mute, but if you could take care of that, it would be great. Um, so uh, in order to understand the interactions between uh, neurons and neuronal activity and other cell types within the circuit, like oligodendroglial lineage cells, we've leveraged techniques of modern uh, neuroscience like in vivo optogenetics. And I think probably many people in the audience are, are well aware of um, optogenetics, but I'll just really briefly review it. This allows for control of targeted populations of cells by expressing light sensitive um, ion channels isolated from micro microorganisms in those cells and then delivering light. Um, and this is channel rhodopsin 2. It's a blue light sensitive cation channel isolated from algae. And if we express that in cortical projection neurons in the motor planning or M2 cortex, then if we deliver blue light at the surface of the brain um, at the frequency at which we pulse that light, the neurons will fire action potentials. And uh, that can um, evoke, you know, physiomimetic um, uh, activity within the circuit. If we do this in motor planning, we know that we've, you know, sort of successfully um, uh, recruited activity within that circuit because the mouse starts to execute complex motor behavior. And here, if you look at this mouse um, in the cage, we're pulsing um, blue light um, at the surface of the brain over the premotor cortex at 20 hertz. Uh, which is the frequency at which those um, cortical projection neurons typically fire, and the mouse starts to walk in a circle, which you know is is often what we see as a manifestation of complex motor activity for for a mouse in a cage. And then you know we know we've recruited activity in that circuit, and we can ask really straightforward questions about the way in which other cell types respond to changes in neuronal activity um, within that circuit. And using this approach um, in, in many of the experiments I'm going to talk about today, um, we first noticed an, a number of years ago now that cortical projection neuronal activity recruits circuit-specific proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells very quickly within the cortical colossal projections of that premotor circuit. And we can fate map those dividing cells, um, which are mostly oligodendrocyte precursor cells. The rest of the proliferating cells are pre oligodendrocyte precursor, so just a little bit earlier in the differentiation lineage. And if we fate map these cells by administering the thymidine analog EDU um, at the same time as the optogenetic stimulation, then we can see that those proliferating cells mature and generate new oligodendrocytes, again, specifically within that stimulated circuit. And over time, we find that the myelinated infrastructure of that circuit changes. The myelin changes in a way that we would predict might influence the speed of impulse conduction, uh, the dynamics of the circuit, and perhaps even behavior. And, and, and indeed, what we found was that there was an improvement in motor functional behavior, evident as increased swing speed um, in the, in the um, correlate limb that depended upon the generation of new oligodendrocytes. If we blocked oligodendrocyte generation, then um, the myelin changes didn't happen and um, the motor functional improvement didn't happen. And so we wanted to understand the molecular mechanisms that mediate this communication between neurons and oligodendroglial cells. And we, we hypothesized that the activity regulated neurotrophin 
brain-derived neurotrophic factor um, signaling to its receptor TREC B on oligodendrocyte precursor cells might be an important mechanism. And so we tested that using two different um, uh, genetically engineered mouse models. And the first mouse model uh, um, engineered by Mike Greenberg um, in, at his lab in, at Boston Children's, there is baseline BDNF expression and secretion, but no activity regulated increase in BDNF expression or secretion. And that's because they had deleted the crab binding site in promoter four of the BDNF gene. In the second a genetically engineered mass model, rather than genetically modulating um, the ligand expression, instead we specifically and inducibly deleted um, the BDNF receptor, TREC-B, just from oligodendrocyte precursor cells at various points in um, young adulthood. And what we found is that it, in either of these genetically engineered mouse models, when we repeated that optogenetic experiment, stimulating cortical projection neurons, that in the absence of intact activity regulated BDNF to track B signaling, the oligodendric glial response was entirely lost. So in contrast to uh, wild type mice with intact BDNF um, or intact OPC expression of track B in which there's this expected increase in OPC proliferation in response to the activity, in the absence of that intact signaling access, that um, proliferative response is entirely lost. As a result, there was no new oligodendrocyte generation in either model and no myelin changes in the absence of intact BDNF to track B signaling. So while we think that the mechanism mediating myelin plasticity is much more complex than just this one signaling pathway, this is one required component of this mechanism. And that gives us a molecular handle to begin to ask what um, you know, what aspects of neurological function uh, might be influenced by activity dependent myelination. And using this approach and other labs using similar approaches to block new oligodendrocyte generation, um, we have found that neuronal activity, uh, both glutamatergic and GABAergic neuronal activity, uh, induced either optogenetically, chemogenetically, or through modulation of experience promotes you know, intact um, cognitive function, including attention and short-term memory, memory encoding, various forms of learning, including fear learning, spatial learning, and motor learning, and also contributes to motor function. The changes in myelin that happen as a result of activity within a circuit take two flavors. I've talked so far about this idea of de novo myelination, of new oligodendrocyte generation, and then establishment of new myelin internodes on axons that are either unmyelinated or discontinuously myelinated. There's also remodeling of existing myelin by existing oligodendrocytes. And, and you know, de novo myelination or myelin remodeling seem to happen at, at sort of you know, different places in the nervous system. There's certain circuits and certain regions that seem to exhibit more of one mechanism versus the other. So visual cortex, there seems to be more myelin remodeling. Uh, frontal cortex, there seems to be more de novo myelination, at least in mice. Um, but myelin remodeling involves um, existing oligodendrocytes that change the geometry of existing internodes, making those um, uh, myelin nodes either uh, longer or shorter, um, uh, thicker, or um, thinner. And, and these relatively small changes in the internode can have subtle influences on conduction velocity that can have really important um, downstream effects on circuit dynamics. We and others have been trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that regulate these processes. And, and, and you know, I mentioned the BDNF um, uh, TREC-B signaling mechanism as one important paracrine signaling um, pathway. Uh, Charles French Constance group has found uh, that activity regulated endothelin signaling and superficial cortex regulates uh, myelin remodeling in uh, prefrontal cortex. In addition to these paracrine signaling uh, mechanisms, there are also really fascinating, very well described, still kind of functionally enigmatic neuron to OPC synapses that form. Um, about 25 years ago, Dwight Burgles um, first described these synapses forming between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And these exist on you know, the vast majority of OPCs. Um, they are uh, really, really robustly characterized. They're bona fide synapses. But the role that these neuron to OPC synapses play in activity regulated myelination is still not at all well understood. So something that the field continues to work hard on. 
What is clear is that um, these activity regulated, relatively small changes in myelination in the healthy nervous system tune circuit function to promote coordinated um, circuit dynamics. And, and one example of that is promotion of um, synchronous oscillations between nodes in a neural network. And this has been shown both computationally and now also experimentally. And so if my so if my contributes to healthy, to healthy including attention, memory, and various forms of learning, it makes sense that, um, you know, loss of myelin plasticity might be important in diseases characterized by um, impaired cognitive function. And two examples in which we have studied this um, include cancer therapy related cognitive impairment as a, as a pediatric neurooncologist. That's something that um, I think quite a lot about and have worked on for many, many years. Um, and, and as I'll tell you now, the mechanism um, dysregulating myelin plasticity in the context of cancer therapies um, appears to be immunological in nature. And so we, we worry that other you know, disease states characterized by profound systemic inflammation like COVID might contribute to a similar kind of um, a cognitive impairment syndrome, often called brain fog. Um, so I'll tell you just very briefly about a, a couple of vignettes um, about the loss of myelin homeostasis and plasticity in those disease states. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, cancer therapies cause frequently cause a persistent syndrome of um, impaired cognition that's characterized by loss of um, you know, optimal attention, speed of information processing, multitasking, and memory. Um, and in studying this in rodent models, um, we used a, a rodent model of high dose methotrexate exposure, methotrexate being an anti-metabolite chemotherapy that's very, very commonly associated with persistent uh, deficits in cognition. We found that giving methotrexate systemically um, directly activates white matter microglia. So microglia, the endogenous um, uh, resident myeloid cells in the brain um, have many, many subpopulations. And there's a unique subpopulation in axon tracts and white matter. And those microglia seem to be um, really exquisitely sensitive to um, various toxic and inflammatory challenges. And we see this pattern of white matter microglial reactivity in the subcortical white matter and in the hippocampal white matter after exposure to systemic methotrexate. And we found you know, through in vitro studies that just exposing microglia to the concentration that reaches the brain after systemic administration is sufficient to induce a state of um, neurotoxic reactivity. Once microglia are reactive, they in turn um, induce neurotoxic astrocyte reactivity. And together, these reactive microglia and astrocytes um, dysregulate the oligodendroglial lineage, um, resulting in a loss of myelinated axons and thinner myelin sheaths, as well as just an overt loss of um, oligodendrocyte numbers. We know that the microglia are central to this process because if we deplete microglia, in this case using a CSF1R inhibitor, um, that actually restores the oligodendroglial lineage deficits and rescues cognition in this mouse model. So kind of on the heels of this study, understanding that, you know, microglial reactivity, which is uh, you know, particularly in axon tracks, a very, very um, reactive process, Understanding that 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 was centrally an uh, um, inflammatory response when COVID when the COVID pandemic began, I really worried that we would begin to see a similar syndrome um, of of sort of brain fog of of impaired attention, uh, concentration, multitasking, and uh, memory. And when that became so evident early in the pandemic that it was a major major problem for many people, even after relatively mild COVID, we decided to study that. And so I reached out to um, Akiko Uwasaki, who's really a thought leader in um, the immunological response to viral infections and has been very much a thought leader in um, COVID. And um, we utilized uh, together a mouse model that um, her lab had recently, then recently developed, um, in which there is um, a mild COVID syndrome induced in mice that is restricted to the respiratory system. So um, these mice are engineered to only be infectable uh, with SARS-CoV-2 in their respiratory system. Um, and then they're given a, a small dose of intranasal SARS-CoV-2. And these mice 
really don't exhibit much behaviorally. They don't lose weight. They continue to groom. They clear the virus um, from the respiratory system in about seven days. And there's no evidence of any infection outside of the nervous system. And yet when we examine these mice either a week later or even seven weeks later, we see the exact same pattern of subcortical and hippocampal white matter microglial reactivity. Um, and together with that, as we would um, have predicted, there's a loss of oligodendrocytes and an impairment in, in myelin. Um, there's a, a dropout of myelinated axons that when we compare myelinated axon number after um, this model of mild respiratory restricted COVID or after methotrexate chemotherapy, we see that they're fairly similar. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that myelin plasticity is interesting and important in um, healthy cognition and, and other neurological functions that deficiencies in myelin homeostasis and plasticity can contribute to impaired cognitive function. But what happens if, if you know, there's too much myelination? What happens in diseases characterized by aberrantly increased um, uh, activity? For example, generalized epilepsy syndromes. Could this sort of myelin plasticity actually become part of the disease process and augment the disease process. And that's a question that Juliet Knowles, um, when she was a postdoc with me, wanted to answer. And so together with John Huguenard here at Stanford, we wondered whether myelination might become maladaptive in generalized epilepsy syndromes. And using um, two different rodent models of an Axon's epilepsy um, syndrome that, that uh, John Huguenard's lab had developed, uh, we tested this idea that, that the aberrant neural activity might cause hypermyelination within the seizure network, which might promote hypersynchrony between nodes in the seizure network and therefore exacerbate the seizure syndrome. Indeed, when we looked at either his, his rat model of Epson's epilepsy or this um, uh, genetically engineered mouse model of Epson's epilepsy, we see that there is an increase in myelination, this occurs only after the seizures begin. So when we look at these mice or these rats prior to seizure onset, they have normal myelination, indistinguishable from wild type mice. Um, the myelin changes are specific to the seizure network. So after the seizures begin, there's an increase in both number of uh, myelinated axons as well as the thickness of the myelin sheath, but that's only evident in the thalamocortical circuitry um, involved in the seizure network and much, much, um, and no, no myelin changes evident outside of um, the core seizure network. The myelin changes also depend upon the seizure. So if we take the same mouse model and we treat it with ethosuximide, which prevents seizures in this particular mouse model and also in Epson's epilepsy generally, um, then we see that there um, are no myelin changes. And so the question became, does this aberrantly increased myelin as a result of these activity dependent mechanisms, does this promote increased synchrony within the seizure network and therefore exacerbate the epilepsy syndrome contributing to you know, what happens in the natural history of this disease if untreated, that there are more seizures um, uh, per day, for example, um, over time uh, with untreated epilepsy. So we tested this by blocking activity regulated myelination. And, and there's a couple different ways to do that. In this case, we used um, the um, model that I described earlier in which we delete TREK-B specifically from oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Then we do intracranial EEG in these mice, we find that the ictal coherence, the synchrony between nodes in the seizure network um, is decreased in mice that lack activity regulated myelination. And accordingly, when we look over time, we find that many fewer seizures happen per day in the um, mice that lack activity uh, regulated myelination compared to wild type mice um, as the seizure syndrome progresses. So we think that myelin plasticity is important in, in healthy neurological function, deficient in diseases of impaired cognition, or at least some diseases of impaired cognition, and, and can be maladaptive in diseases characterized by abnormal patterns of activity. Um, I've just shown you data for generalized epilepsy. We've also studied this with respect to reward learning and response to drugs of abuse like opiates um, and see a similar kind of disease promoting pathophysiology. But what happens if um, the OPC in question has an oncogenic mutation? You know, could these really powerful interactions between neurons and oligodendric glial cells be hijacked in the context of glial malignancies? <laughs> 
And so I'd like to focus now the rest of the talk on this idea of malignant myelin plasticity, of activity-dependent glioma growth. And to introduce you to some of the people who um, have really led this work, this is Hamsa Venkatesh. She was a very brilliant cancer biology PhD student in my lab who stayed with me for her postdoc and is now leading her own independent program at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, again, if there's anybody in the audience looking for a postdoctoral mentor, Hamsa is wonderful. Similarly brilliant is Ewan Pan, who finished her postdoctoral fellowship with me um, after a first postdoc with David Gutman, um, and has now gone on to MD Anderson um, to start her own independent laboratory, another place to look at for uh, postdoc if anybody's interested. And then Katie Taylor and Tara Barron are presently postdocs in the lab. Katie is on the job market this year. And as a pediatric neuro-oncologist, um, these are the diseases that I and my laboratory, um, you know, spend most of the time thinking about. These are our glial malignancies of childhood. And as I mentioned earlier, these arise in a pretty predictable spatiotemporal pattern. I think for the pediatric neuro-oncologists in the audience, somebody tells you, you know, the age of a child and that they have a glioma, you can probably guess where it is. Uh, and this really speaks to, a, you know, dysregulated um, underlying process of neurodevelopment. Just to introduce you to, to some of the tumors I'm gonna talk about, um, this is uh, an optic pathway glioma. This is a low-grade uh, glioma that occurs both spontaneously and then also very frequently in association with a tumor predisposition syndrome, neurofibromatosis type one. This um, is diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, also called a diffuse midline glioma of the pons. This is one of the worst imaginable cancers. It, it strikes children typically in mid-childhood between ages of six and eight. It can happen at any time. Um, so anybody in the audience who sees this in a teenager or sees this in an adult, um, you know, it absolutely can happen outside of that window, but, but certainly peaks sharply in incidence um, between ages six and eight. A very um, molecularly related disease occurring in the thalamus, diffuse midline glioma of the thalamus tends to happen at slightly older children, um, peaking in incidence around age um, 10. And unfortunately, both of these diseases are uh, presently universally lethal. This is a hemispheric high-grade glioma occurring in an adolescent, which, you know, the, the hemispheric tumors can happen also at any age um, in childhood adolescence and throughout adulthood, but um, uh, peak in incidence in, in um, adolescence. And the idea that neurons might be an important component of the tumor microenvironment actually is something that a, a very prescient and, and um, insightful neuropathologist named H.J. Shear recognized nearly a hundred years ago. And what he described, and, and at the time called the secondary structures of shear, was the propensity of um, high-grade glioma cells and low-grade glioma cells to cluster in really tight microanatomical association with neurons in the tumor microenvironment. This is something that I thought a lot about when I was a resident and a fellow um, looking at, at um, you know, photomicrographs of my patient's tumors. Um, and this is an H&E stain of an early postmortem sample from a five-year-old patient of mine who I cared for when I was a pediatric neuro-oncology fellow. And I just wanna point out this ventral ponte neuron with these uh, diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma cells just clustering around the neuronal soma. We know that um, these tumor cells cluster around mature neur neuronal soma and then invade along their axons. I just wanna take a, um, a pause and say that this particular child's um, uh, tumor donation in the in their early hours after his passing enabled us to make the very first um, genetically, uh, very first uh, patient-derived mouse model of DIPG and, and patient-drive cell culture of DIPG. And it's really through similar such just incredibly selfless donations from patients and their families that we're able to do all of the work that we do. So I just wanna acknowledge that really critically important um, contribution from patients. And so to test whether neuronal activity similarly influences malignant glioma cells like it does their normal glial counterparts, um, we did that same optogenetic um, experiment, optogenetically stimulating cortical projection neurons in the premotor cortex. Um, but here in the, in the context of a diffusely infiltrating pediatric cortical glioblastoma that was isolated from an adolescent patient of mine. And what we found was that well, when we, we stimulated cortical projection, cortical projection, 
that there was this marked increase in tumor cell proliferation, just as their normal counterparts exhibit, and that that resulted in an overall increase in tumor burden, again, specifically within the stimulated circuit. And so indeed, brain activity can drive brain cancer growth. More recently, and in collaboration with David Gutman's lab and work that was led by, by you and Pan, we looked at um, optopathway gliomas in a genetically engineered mouse model of NF1 associated optopathway glioma. And these mice uh, develop optic nerve tumors very reliably at nine weeks of age in, in almost all mice and more than 90, 95% of mice. And what we found is that if we optogenetically stimulate the optic nerve um, just prior to tumor onset, so beginning around six weeks of age, that when we look later on at 16 weeks of age, the tumors that had formed are much larger in the stimulated mice than in litter mate control mice that we identically manipulated but didn't turn on the blue light. Now that optic pathway glioma mouse model represents a really exciting opportunity to ask questions not only about tumor growth, but also tumor initiation, um, because we know exactly where and exactly when these tumors are going to form. And actually we don't need to optogenetically stimulate the nerve. Um, you know, this is the optic pathway. We can modulate the activity of the optic nerve simply by changing visual experience. And so we tried to get the mice to wear these sunglasses and that was a disaster. They chewed them up, they ate them, there's plastic everywhere. It's not something I recommend. Uh, so instead we then, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, so instead we put mice in um, into complete darkness at various time points around the time of tumor initiation. And we found that if we decreased optic nerve activity by decreasing visual experience in this way, either at the time that these tumors form at nine weeks of age, or even just after at 12 weeks of age, and then examine the optic nerves at 16 weeks of age, that we found far fewer and much smaller tumors in mice that had been dark reared compared to those litter mate controls raised with normal visual experience. And if instead we put mice in darkness before tumor initiation at six weeks of age, absolutely no tumors formed, even if we put them back in normal light cycles after what appears to be a critical susceptibility period for tumorigenesis in this model. And despite the very strong genetic predisposition for tumorigenesis, really underscoring how important this intersection is of um, you know, oncogenic mutation induced susceptibility and an environment that enables tumor formation. So what are the mechanisms that are mediating these really um, powerful interactions between neurons and glioma cells? Um, you know, we thought initially that there might be activity regulated paracrine factor secretion. And so we tested that uh, using either cortical or retina plus optic nerve explants, and then collecting the secreted paracrine factors from conditioned medium at varying levels of neuronal activity. So either silencing neuronal activity with citrototoxin allowing for spontaneous neuronal activity or optogenetically stimulating activity. And then we found that when we put this conditioned medium onto cultures of glioma cells, that there was an activity dose dependent increase in glioma proliferation lost when we silenced activity with tetrodotoxin. Now, as I think many in the audience know, gliomas are a sort of a family of molecularly and clinically related um, diseases. They are distinct diseases, but we found that the response to activity regulated secreted paracrine factors um, was conserved across multiple different forms of both high and low grade glioma. And when we you know, examine what um, factors are present, what's mediating you know, th these interactions using this particular system, we found that it was a it was a, a large molecule, not a small molecule, and um, you know through various biochemical manipulations that it was it, it was a, it was a protein or set of proteins. And so doing proteomics on that um, uh, medium, we identified using this this strategy two important glioma uh, mitogens. One, not at all surprisingly, is brain derived neurotrophic factor, you know, playing a role similar to that that we see in the normal glial context. But really unexpectedly, we found uh, an activity regulated shedding of a synaptic adhesion molecule called neuroligin three. 
Now, neurolinkin-3 is a very well-known um, postsynaptic adhesion molecule that plays a number of roles um, in um, uh, you know, sort of healthy uh, synaptic function, both at glutamatergic and GABAergic um, synapses, regulating synaptic strength, modulating synaptogenesis. Uh, it also, in, there's a point mutation in neuroligin-3 associated with a, um, an autism spectrum disorder. But it was not known to be a mitogen in any context. And actually it was not even known to be cleaved and secreted, but we find that neuroligin-3 is cleaved at the membrane with release of this large N-terminal ectodomain in a strictly activity dependent manner through the enzymatic activity of the metalloprotease atom 10. And so the next question we asked, well, you know, what cell types are secreting early three? Um, and when we look at cell expression database, um, you know, information, we find that early three is expressed not only by neurons and a variety of types of neurons, but also uh, very, very robustly by oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And so we genetically and conditionally deleted early three from different subpopulations of cells and found that really interestingly, OPCs are the chief source of activity regulated um, atom 10 shedding in the brain, uh, which places the OPC in the tumor microenvironment in a really important way, but also I think asks some very important, very basic questions about the role of neuroligin-3 in myelin biology um, in general. And that's something that uh, we're working hard to understand now. But how important is this molecule? There are many cell intrinsic mechanisms by which tumors proliferate and grow and, and a number of microenvironmental factors. I've just described a couple of them. Um, so we wanted to understand how much neuroligin-3 contributed to tumor pathophysiology. And to do that, we um, xenografted patient-derived brain cancer cells into the environment of either the neuroligin-3 wild type or neuroligin-3 knockout brain. And what we found was really surprising. Rather than even just slowing in their growth. We found that in the absence of neuroligin-3 from the brain, that, that the tumors simply stagnate. Here in the wild type brain, these GFP labeled tumor cells, you know, expand and they invade along the corpus callosum. Uh, here, six months after xenografting the neuroligin-3 knockout brain containing um, xenografts, the, the xenografts persist but they don't grow. And we can monitor that in uh, real time using in vivo bioluminescent imaging. And here we find that, you know, there really is this stagnation, this lack of expansion in the context of a neuroligin-3 knockout microenvironment. And that apparent dependency on neuroligin-3 in the microenvironment is conserved across multiple different types of, of high-grade glioma in multiple brain regions, including the cortex and the brain stem but we don't see that same dependency in a patient-derived model of breast cancer brain metastasis, suggesting that neuro while neuroligin-3 appears to be important across multiple forms of glioma, it may not be important for all types of cancer. So turning back to that, uh, that uh, one associated mouse model um, of optic glioma, we wondered whether neuroligin-3 also played an important role in nf one associated optic pathway glioma. And we wondered that and not only because of the, the uh, important role it clearly plays in um, the you know high grade glioma context, but also because we noticed that in the NF1 mutant optic nerve, remember this is a tumor predisposition syndrome in which every cell in the body has lost um, a functional one at least one functional copy of um, the NF1 gene, that there was aberrantly increased shedding of neuroligin three, uh, perhaps suggesting that that's part of the susceptibility to tumors within the optic nerve. And so we tested this by crossing this NF1 um, optic pathway glioma mouse model that the Gutman lab had generated with the, the neuroligin-3 knockout mouse model. And what we found uh, was that this largely phenocopied the results of the dark rearing experiments that raising mice with normal visual experience, but without microenvironmental neuroligin-3 resulted in many fewer and much smaller tumors. And similarly, treating um, optic pathway glioma models or treating uh, a, you know, the high-grade glioma models with ADAM10 inhibitors to block neuroligin-3 secretion also resulted in um, a slower growth and, and in this case, uh, fewer tumors present. So what's going on? How is the synaptic adhesion molecule influencing the glioma cell? Well, we find that you know, after neuroligin-3 is shed from the postsynaptic cell, chiefly OPCs, um, and released into the tumor microenvironment, it binds to the glioma cell and recruits numerous oncogenic signaling pathways. And, and this helps us understand its role as a mitogen 
but it really doesn't explain that unexpected dependency. And so we dug deeper and looked at the gene expression changes and noticed that when neuroligin three binds, it regulates the expression of a number of different genes, including prominently synapse associated genes. And if we look at the, the you know, sort of families of genes regulated by neuroligin three, we see this really prominent regulation of a number of synapse associated genes, including a feed forward effect um, on its own expression, uh, upregulating neuroligin three expression in the tumor cell itself, together with upregulation of the BDNF receptor, TREC B, but also a number of other you know, AMP receptor subunits and other synapse associated structural proteins. In addition to the synaptic gene expression, I just want to point out that there's a number of other um, families of genes that are uh, processes that are uh, strongly regulated by neuroligin-3, suggesting it may be um, something of a master regulator of um, neuron glioma interactions. So seeing that synaptic gene expression um, made us wonder what seemed, it seemed like a crazy idea at the time, that like there are synapses between neurons, and healthy glial precursor cells, there may also be synapses between neurons and glioma cells. Well, when we look by immunoelectron microscopy in which we can unambiguously identify the tumor cells based on immunogold labeling, we do see these very clear synaptic structures between presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic glioma cells. And testing the idea that neuroligin-3 may be functioning to promote the formation of these synapses uh, perhaps this is its most fundamental role, we do see that there is there are far fewer um, neuron to glioma synapses that form in the absence of neuroligin-3 from the tumor microenvironment. But, you know, are these neuron to glioma synapses functional? Or are these just a shadow of the cell type from which we believe these tumors arise? To test that, um, you know, answer that question, we performed whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology recording from these GFP labeled glioma cells in a very a, a very tra uh, experimentally tractable circuit, the hippocampus. And then after we um, record from the cells, we dye fill them with biocytin and then go back and just confirm that uh, we were indeed patched onto a tumor cell and not accidentally onto an unknown. And when we do this experiment, we find is that a subpopulation of tumor cells within every patient derived tumor model that we examine exhibit these very clear excitatory postsynaptic currents. These um, depend upon action potentials. They're blocked by a tetrodotoxin. They exhibit multiple electrophysiological characteristics of bona fide synapses, including paired pulse facilitation and quantal events, single vesicle events called mini EPSCs. And more specifically, this very first kind of synapse that we identified are mediated by calcium permeable AMP receptors. We had discovered these in pediatric high-grade gliomas, um, both, both diffuse midline gliomas and pediatric cortical um, hemispheric uh, glioblastoma. Um, Frank Winkler's group, uh, together with Thomas Kunar in Heidelberg, identified the exact same thing in um, adult uh, glioblastoma. Uh, so, very nice when the study came out, which really still seemed like uh, an improbable finding. It was very nice to have it um, confirmed already by another group. Now in the healthy brain, um, AMPA receptor mediated synapses and other synaptic types as well exhibit mechanisms of adaptive plasticity. In more active circuits, those synapses are modulated in an activity dependent way, um, often in ways that promote uh, increased strength of those synapses. And we wondered whether the tumors were hijacking those mechanisms of synaptic plasticity as well. There are a couple of, well, there are many different ways that synaptic plasticity um, can uh, uh, can come to pass, but one uh, one mechanism is mediated by BDNF to track B signaling. And we knew based on uh, gene expression profiles that that was likely to be an important mechanism in glioma. And so we tested this um, by doing that same electrophysiology um, uh, sort of uh, experimental setup, recording from um, the glioma cells, xenografted into the hippocampus, and then perfusing BDNF over this xenografted hippocampal slice. And when we do that, we find that the current in the tumor cell is augmented, that, that there is an increase in the strength or the, the amplitude of that current. Um, that depends upon TREC B expression in the tumor cell. If we CRISPR delete the um, gene encoding TREC B and TREC2, then we completely lose that, um, uh, that effect of BDNF on uh, malignant synaptic strength. 
And just in the interest of time to summarize um, the rest of, of this, this study, which was recently published, um, we find that BDNF to track B signaling between neurons and glioma cells increases AMPA receptor trafficking within the glioma cell to the postsynaptic membrane, thereby augmenting the strength of that current. Now, what about other synaptic types? Um, when we look at gene expression profiles across different kinds of gliomas, and this is data from Mario Suva's database, we see that there's fairly robust expression of GABA-A receptor genes in um, H3K27 and mutant diffuse midline gliomas, and to a lesser extent, but still fairly robust in um, IDH mutant high-grade gliomas, but not in IDH wild-type glioblastomas. When we um, do that same kind of patch clamp electrophysiology experiment, now isolating for GABAergic signaling, we see really clear GABAergic um, uh, postsynaptic currents in the glioma cells. These depend upon uh, GABA-A receptor um, signaling. They're blocked by the GABA-A blocker picrotoxin, as well as by another GABA-A blocker by cuculein. And they're augmented by allosteric modulators of GABA-A synapses like benzodiazepines. And here I'm showing you data with lorazepam or Avigan. We think about GABAergic synapses as being um, hyperpolarizing or inhibitory, and indeed they are in, in mature neurons, but actually in, in stem and, and precursor cells and immature neurons, GABA is instead depolarizing, uh, due to, and whether GABA, is, it's just a chloride channel. So whether GABA is hyperpolarizing or depolarizing just depends upon the intracellular chloride concentration of the cell. And we find that in um, diffuse uh, midline gliomas like DIPG, that GABA is indeed depolarizing. And that just to show you, not only is there not gene expression of GABA-A, um, you know, prominent gene expression of GABA-A receptor genes, but we don't see any GABAergic currents in um, uh, pediatric hemispheric IDH wild type, histone wild type diffuse um, uh, hemispheric gliomas. And again, the, the, the depolarization um, effect of GABA is due to a very high intracellular chloride concentration within DIPG and DMG cells that is not present in glioblastoma cells. Um, so just as a, um, to sort of calculate that out, you know, it's a 70 millimolar chloride concentration inside DIPG, only a 20 millimolar um, uh, chloride concentration in IDH wild type glioblastoma. And this is due to expression of the chloride transporter and KCC more. So this suggests that, you know, GABAergic interneurons might also promote uh, DIPG and DMG growth. And indeed, if we optogenetically stimulate GABAergic interneurons, this increases the uh, proliferation rate of DMGs in, in mouse models. And importantly, GABA-A agonists like um, Ativan accelerate the proliferation rate of these tumors when given um, uh, in vivo and this shortened survival in, in mouse models of DIPG. So it's important to think about which neurophysiological drugs we give to patients that might block interactions between neurons and glioma cells, but it's also really important to think about the medicines we give that might augment them uh, and, and might be less safe than other, other medication choices we could make. So in summary, what I'm, I'm telling you is that gliomas integrate into neural circuits. They do this both uh, synaptically through bona fide neuron to glioma synapses that are then elaborated and amplified through mechanisms of adaptive plasticity. And they also integrate electrically through um, uh, uh, potassium evoked currents that are then amplified in a tumor to tumor gap junction coupled network. That's a lot of different ways that tumor cells can undergo membrane depolarization, um, which is a very metabolically expensive thing to do. And so that, that suggests that um, depolarization might itself be growth promoting and beneficial to the tumor. And we tested that idea again using optogenetics, but this time expressing these light sensitive um, cation channels, channel rhodopsin 2, in the tumor cells themselves. So in that way, we can use blue light to just depolarize the tumor cell and we can do this in vivo. And when we do that experiment, we find that indeed there's an increase in the proliferation rate of the tumor cells. 
Now, the tumors aren't just undergoing membrane depolarization. They're actively remodeling and, and, and recruiting mechanisms that augment the size of those currents, the strength of those currents. And so we wondered whether more a more depolarizing current might differentially promote tumor growth. And we can also test that optogenetically if we uh, give a short light pulse um, in channel rhodopsin to expressing glioma cells, that evokes a medium-sized depolarizing current, whereas a longer light pulse that keeps the channel open for longer induces a larger depolarizing current. And so uh, using those two different optogenetic strategies, we find that more depolarizing stimuli result in a greater increase in tumor growth. Conversely, if we block these synaptic currents, either pharmacologically or in this case, uh, genetically by expressing a dominant negative uh, GLUA2 subunit of the AMP receptor, that has a stark um, growth inhibitory effect. So we can, we can visualize this electrical activity in the cancer using genetically encoded calcium indicators. And I think this particular calcium imaging movie really underscores what is for me a really startling new understanding that these cancers are electrically active tissues. And that is not how we have been going about understanding or treating them. And so now as a field, we really need to understand and, and um, research the mechanisms of malignant circuit assembly, plasticity, and evolution over the disease course to discern the granular details of these voltage sensitive mechanisms of proliferation. And I suggest that in doing so, we will glean important insights um, into normal neural development and plasticity viewed through this uh, magnified lens of glial cancers. To conclude, um, there is really a, a malignant network that is integrating into the normal network and there's bi-directional interaction. Um, uh, work from my lab and from many others now show that not only do neurons drive gliomas, but the gliomas increase the excitability of the neurons driving this um, malignant cycle. As we begin to understand this, uh, new targets for therapy begin to emerge. Um, we may be able to target neuroligin-3 cleavage and binding, AMP receptor signaling, glutamate reuptake, neurotrophin signaling, synaptogenic factors, potassium channels, gap junctions, and in certain subtypes of tumors like DMGs, GABA signaling. And I think the mechanistic parallels that are evident between healthy neuron glial interactions um, that underpin myelin plasticity and malignant neuron glioma interactions driving pathogenesis of these terrible tumors really underscores the extent to which these cancers are just hijacking mechanisms of normal neurodevelopment and plasticity and demand that we begin to approach gliomas and other cancers from a neuroscience perspective. So many people to thank um, in the lab, past and present, our collaborators, funding sources, and very importantly, the patients and families whose donation of tumor tissue enables all of the work that we do. Thanks so much for your attention and hopefully we have a couple minutes here at the end left for questions. Thank you so much for uh, a really amazing talk. I have a lot of questions. I'll just ask one and then see if other people have any. Um, you identified Neuroligin-3 as a potential target, and it looks like you have a trial uh, already running for um, cleavage of the Neuroligin molecule. What is the consequence of decreasing Neuroligin signaling in children and in adults? Is that a signal we can afford to do without? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's certainly one of the questions um, that we're we're ans we're asking. I, I think some clues can be gleaned from the neuroligin three knockout mouse, which is very normal. So yeah. um, the neuroligin three mutant mouse is not. It has you know the same autism spectrum um, behaviors that that come with that particular point mutation. But knocking out neuroligin three results in compensation by neuroligin one in healthy cells and um, does not seem to influence behavior. In, in any obvious way. There's some perhaps very subtle, subtle behavioral changes in that mouse. Um, so that's reassuring. But as we uncover the role for neuroligin-3 signaling in normal oligodendrocyte precursor cells, um, you know, it does suggest that we need to look perhaps even harder at um, the neuroligin-3 knockout mice and, and certainly in any clinical trial, um, any, you know, long-term prospective trial um, to, to do cognitive behavioral testing, um, you know, in not just in the mice, but cognitive testing in kids. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I think there's a question in the chat. Um, 
The question is, how are we able to visualize myelin changes in epileptic patients? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So Juliet Knowles, um, who is a pediatric neuro, um, a, a pediatric epileptologist um, who, who led that mouse work, has gone on to use diffusion, ten diffusion tensor imaging and other um, kind of myelin imaging, you know, uh, MRI modalities to, to try to measure this and actually has some evidence um, for altered myelination within seizure now. Um, she's just published one um, one paper and has been working really hard on on um, in, in high resolution looking at myelin in kids with epilepsy. So check out her work. And I think a follow up question in the epilepsy model: which anatomic areas were targeted for the myelin study? Was it the thalamic nuclei? And then thanks and congratulations on a wonderful <laughs> talk. Oh, thank you, thank you. So we looked in the corpus in the anterior corpus callosum in the region and in the subcortical the subcortical um, uh, white matter um, within the seizure network. And then we looked at the posterior um, uh, corpus callosum singulum, uh, cingulate um, and, you know, found, I'm sorry, I need another cup of coffee in the splenium and, and did not find myelin changes, you know, in the posterior uh, network, but yes, in the, in the region involved in the thalamocortical network. We haven't looked in the thalamus yet. And the thalamus is a very, very important and interesting structure. It's someplace I would love to um, look in more detail. We just, we haven't done that yet. I have one last question. It seems like when you were talking about, um, patients who are responding to this inflammatory stimulus of COVID, even mild COVID with activation of microglia. I mean, we all, or most of us get COVID. And so there must be some sort of predisposition for this. And then you also talked about other patients yeah. who um, seem to be uh, more responsive to normal activity. And maybe those patients have more myelination and maybe that predisposes for epilepsy. Is there any sort of data on whether um, that you can see a dichotomy in, in the population between like our, for example, epilepsy patients less likely to get long COVID? I'm not sure if I can draw those lines, but I can tell you that as part of our COVID studies, um, we identified one um, chemokine that is sufficient to induce not all, but part of the pathophysiology that we see in the brain, part of the microglial reactivity and, and consequent downstream effects um, on precursor cells. And we looked at a, a patient population of um, patients who have uh, long COVID, some of whom report brain fog syndrome, some of whom do not. And we found that the level of this chemokine, CCL11, did strongly correlate with um, those individuals who did report the cognitive symptoms. And when we take a closer look at that population, there was a big spread in CCL11 serum levels. Um, we found that patients with autoimmune diseases were more likely to have both the elevated CCL11 levels and the um, cognitive um, symptoms together with their long COVID. Just further kind of suggesting that individual differences in the immune system, you know, can result in individual, um, you know, outcomes of, you know, after a similar challenge like my own Thank you so much. Um, we're at time, so I want to be respectful for your time. And thank you very much for sharing uh, your work and your time with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.